The show starts with a school bus full of kids making its way through the pretty hills of a mountain town. Inside, a young, blonde-haired girl named Camille is seemingly lost in her world. But a teacher interrupts her train of thought and hands her an assignment due the following Monday. Everything seems normal until the tires screech, trying to bring the bus to a halt. However, the bus collides with the side rails and falls off the edge, killing all the children inside. We then cut to the present day, where a girl can be seen climbing the side rails onto a road. This girl is none other than Camille herself. Confused and cold from the chilly weather, she heads towards her home on foot. Meanwhile, in the town, Camille's father, Jack, a ragged, shabby man, enters a hall where a support group meeting is taking place. One of the participants announces that she is having a child and expresses how life prevails despite numerous sorrows. Jack listens to the talk from the doorway, but doesn't join the group. At the same time, Camille is making her way towards her home all alone when suddenly the lights across the entire town go out. We see Camille's mother, Claire, lighting three candles right next to the photos of her daughter. Only a few moments later, the lights flicker back on, and she promptly blows off the candles. After a while, Claire gets busy folding laundry in her room. She hears the sound of cutlery downstairs and assumes it's her daughter, Lena. However, when she makes her way into the kitchen, she finds Camille digging into the refrigerator. Claire freezes on the spot bewildered at the sight of her long-lost daughter casually making a sandwich. On the other hand, Camille seems to have no recollection of the accident, or her death. The young girl reveals that she simply woke up near the mountains, and walked all the way home on foot. Next, we see Camille's twin sister, Lena, who is in her late teens now, drinking with her friends at a local bar named Dog Star. Her father, Jack, is sleeping with a waitress, Lucy, in the room above the bar. Apparently, Lucy is forced to pay legal fees to her ex-husband on a regular basis. She borrows the money from Jack, and they plan to meet later in the week. But their conversation is interrupted by a call from Jack's ex-wife, Claire, who asks him to come to her as soon as possible. When he reaches his home, Claire tells him that their daughter, Camille, is back, thinking that she must have hallucinated. Jack shakes his head in exasperation. However, he is stunned beyond explanation when he sees his daughter, well and alive, right before his eyes. In the next scene, we are introduced to Dr. Julie Han, who also lives in the same town. As she is returning from her shift late at night, a small kid follows her all the way to her apartment. Julia asks the kid about his parents and his name. But the kid simply stares at her with a mild smile, and replies nothing. Unwilling to leave a small kid outside, she takes him into the building. Before she can open the door to her apartment, her nosy neighbor snoops in and asks who the kid is. Not wanting to have a conversation so late at night, Julie introduces the kid with a fake name, Victor. Once inside the apartment, she tries to get any information from the kid, but he completely ignores her questions. Fed up, she decides to let the kid stay for the night but with a warning. If he doesn't tell her about his parents by morning, she'll have no choice but to take him to the police. In the meantime, Peter, the man hosting the support group earlier, reaches Claire's home. He is slightly surprised to see her ex-husband, Jack, in the kitchen and asks what is happening. Claire promptly takes him to Camille and introduces Peter as a psychologist, and a friend. In reality, after the accident, Jack and Claire separated, and the latter is now dating Peter. Peter asks Camille if she remembers anything about the bus accident. To his surprise, she doesn't even remember the bus crashing down the hill. In response, he asks her to open up emotionally whenever she feels comfortable, but doesn't push any information new to her. Camille then asks to be left alone as she feels highly exhausted. When Peter and Claire come back down, Jack passes a passive-aggressive remark at Peter, asking what his psychological knowledge says about this strange situation. Peter replies that he has never seen anything like this ever before. In the four years after his daughter's death, Jack has led a destructive life, trying hard to accept the tragedy. He met with Lucy, a waitress at the Dog Star Bar, who claims to be a psychic with the ability to talk to dead people while having sex. All these years, Jack has engaged in sex with Lucy, and heavy drinking to cope with the tragedy. Now that his daughter is back, he cannot make any sense of the situation. Elsewhere in the town, we see a young woman, Helen Goddard, walking across the streets at night. She enters her husband's home and goes straight to the bedroom 30 years after her death. As she gets into the bed, her husband, George Goddard, who has become old, unlike her, wakes up startled. Scared, he goes downstairs and calls Dr. Julia Han, but does not share what he is witnessing. Unable to process what is happening, 
he heads out of his house late at night. Soon afterwards, the old man climbs on top of a railing and jumps into the local dam, ending his own life. While this is all happening, a young, handsome man named Simon makes his way to the Dog Star Bar. Here, he asks Lucy the whereabouts of a girl named Rowan, adding that she used to work at the bar as a waitress. Surprised, Lucy replies she has never heard of Rowan working at the bar before. In reality, Simon had died six years ago on the day of his marriage with his lover, Rowan. But just like Camille and Helena Goddard earlier, he, too, doesn't have any recollection of his death or the events surrounding it. Meanwhile, Lena, who is also at the bar, listens to this conversation between Lucy and the new guy. She snoops in and tells him that she knows where Rowan lives. Hence, she and Simon leave the bar and head towards the destination. As soon as they reach Rowan's townhouse, Simon bolts away to the door, leaving a puzzled Lena behind. Inside the home, Rowan is trying on her bridal headdress when she suddenly notices Simon in the mirror. She turns around and peeks out the window but sees no one. Suddenly, there is loud knocking and banging on her door. Afraid, she goes to the door and hears her ex-lover, Simon, begging her to open the door. Instead, she falls to the floor in tears, screaming at him to leave her alone. Later that night, Rowan's current fiancé, Sheriff Tommy, comes home and finds her in tears. From their conversation, we come to know that Rowan has had many hallucinations in the past about Simon. She thinks that she had a similar one earlier that night. Across at the Dog Star Bar, Jack engages in sex with Lucy and asks her to talk to Camille's soul in the afterlife. Unaware that Camille has come back, Lucy makes up fake stories, but Jack has none of it. He angrily confronts her about conning him. Scared by Jack's anger, Lucy slaps him and runs away from the bar. Only a little away from the bar, Lucy makes her way through a murky, underground tunnel that we saw Lena and Simon pass through earlier. Suddenly, a hooded man grabs her from behind, stabs her multiple times in the belly, and leaves her bleeding on the floor. In the next scene, we see Lena arriving at her home late at night. She climbs into her room through a window, avoiding confrontation with her mother, who is downstairs. Camille, who is next door, hears the commotion from her sister's room and goes to check. As Camille opens the door, she comes face to face with her twin sister, Lena, who is now much older than her. Lena freaks out and calls for her mother. The show then takes us four years back to the day of the accident. Camille is going on a school trip with her friends, but Lena has managed to skip school by pretending to be sick. While Camille sits in her school bus, as we saw in the first scene, Lena receives her boyfriend at home. Right when Lena is having sex for the first time in her life, Camille gets a weird sensation and rushes to the front of the bus. She bangs on the door, asking the bus to be stopped. While the driver yells at her to return to her seat, he suddenly notices a child in the middle of the road and swerves the bus. Ultimately, the vehicle drops off the hill and kills every single passenger. We see the child standing in the middle of the road, none other than Victor. In another flashback scene, we see Simon performing along with his band at the Dog Star Bar. His girlfriend, Rowan, has just agreed to marry him, and the band congratulate both of them. Also present at the bar are the twins, Lena and Camille, along with their parents. Lena pokes around with the drums while the band is taking a short break. Simon notices her and teaches her a few basic strums. Rowan captures this wholesome moment between her soon-to-be husband and the little girl in a photo which later got pinned on the bar's display board. The day of their marriage finally arrives, but Rowan and Simon are still in bed together. Before Simon returns to his house to get ready, Rowan reveals she is pregnant with his baby. Later that day, Rowan eagerly awaits Simon at the local church. Instead, she is greeted by Sheriff Tommy with the grim news of Simon's death. A few years after Simon's death, Rowan had their baby, Chloe. She also started dating Sheriff Tommy who promised to take care of her daughter too. Six years after the event, in the present day, we see Tommy and Rowan at the church preparing for their marriage. Sitting beside them is Chloe, who asks for permission to go to the bathroom. Suddenly, Tommy gets a call from his deputy police officer, informing him about the attack on Lucy in the tunnel. We also know that Lucy is still alive, although gravely injured. Because of this, Tommy has to leave quickly, leaving only the priest and Rowan behind. Elsewhere, Dr. Julie Han goes to the police station looking for the missing children's report to get any information on Victor. However, when she encounters Deputy Sheriff Nikki Banks, she merely records a statement and goes back home empty-handed. Although the interaction between Julie and Nikki is brief, there is clearly some history between the two women. On the other hand, Lena runs into Camille in their bathroom early in the morning. Camille admits to her sister that she is afraid of herself because she realizes she came back after being dead. However, Lena doesn't reply to anything and goes to the other bathroom. Later, at breakfast, Camille gobbles down several pancakes as she seems to have developed quite an appetite. But when Lena comes down to the breakfast table, she confronts her parents for acting like everything is normal when things are pretty weird. 
When her parents try to calm her down, she angrily storms away from the house and goes to the Dog Start Bar to hang out with her friends. At the same time, Simon also enters the bar, although he doesn't have enough money for a meal. Yet he orders a lot of food and starts a small conversation with the owner, Tony Darrow. Simon learns that Rowan had left her job as a waitress a long time ago, and now works at a local library. Their conversation is interrupted by Lena, who confronts Simon for abandoning her last night without an explanation. While Simon apologizes, Lena notices that his face seems familiar to her. But the mysterious stranger excuses himself from the bar, pretending to go to the bathroom and slips away without paying the bill. After a few hours, the police arrive at the bar for the investigation of the attacks on Lucy. Taking advantage of this, Lena's boyfriend, Hunter, complains to a policeman about Simon, who he thinks is shady. After noting Hunter's complaint, the police leave with the bar owner, Tony under custody. He is one of the suspects in the gruesome attack. Suddenly, Lena remembers why Simon seemed so familiar to her. She immediately goes to the bar's display board and finds the photo of her on the drum set. Standing beside her is Simon, who doesn't seem to have aged a single day. Meanwhile, Tony is taken to the police station, where officer Nikki Banks accuses him of attacking not just Lucy, but also several other women. Seven years ago, Tony's car was seen breaking a red light two blocks away from the scene of an attempted homicide. The victim had several stab wounds along with bite marks on her belly. The officer then shows several other photos of victims with similar wounds on their bellies. But due to the lack of evidence, the police couldn't charge him. Tony vehemently denies all the accusations, but we can see that he is hiding something from the police. The scene then shifts, and we see Simon at the local library where Rowan currently works. Nervous about how she will react, Simon stands behind her but doesn't utter a word. On the other hand, Rowan senses someone watching her, and turns around, only to be greeted by her ex-lover. However, she still thinks she is hallucinating but admits that she has finally made peace with his death and is ready to move on with Tommy. Hearing this, Simon exits the library quietly when Rowan is distracted by a group of kids. However, barely a few minutes after Simon exits the library, a police officer stops him based on a complaint made by Lena's boyfriend earlier at the bar. Simon is then taken to the police station, where the deputy officer informs him that he died seven years ago. Consequently, Simon is accused of identity theft by Tommy, who recognizes him as Rowan's ex-boyfriend, in the meantime, Camille is becoming increasingly frustrated about how people treat her like an abnormality. Enraged, she goes to her sister's room and tears down all the photos of Lena and her boyfriend, Hunter. She then sneaks out of the house without her parents' knowledge. Later that afternoon, Claire doesn't find Camille anywhere in the home and gets scared. She immediately informs Jack, as well as Lena, about the situation. However, when Jack arrives at the home drunk, Claire leaves him behind and searches for her daughter alone. The whole day passes as she looks out for Camille on the streets without success. Only when the evening arrives does Claire find her daughter crying on the steps of the Dog Star Bar. The teenage girl opens up to her mother about how everyone except her has moved forward. Claire soothes her daughter and takes her back home. In the final part of the show, we see two scenes playing back to back. Over at Dr. Julie's house, she puts Victor to sleep but breaks down in the bathroom. When she gets ready to take a bath, we see her stomach has the same kind of scars as the murder victims in the police photos that we saw earlier. On the other hand, Tommy searches around Rowan's old stuff that is kept in the attic of his house. Among other things, he finds a photo of Simon, who doesn't seem to have aged a single day since the photo was taken. In a flashback from seven years ago, a younger Julie is dressed in a skin-tight suit, a Marie Antoinette wig, and a Mexican Calabras mask for Halloween. She struts down the street and encounters her girlfriend, who is also masked. After some bickering between kisses, Julie skips out on the party as she has to work in the morning. As she's walking through a tunnel, a hooded figure attacks and stabs her brutally in the stomach while whispering, it's over. The scene then cuts to the present day where the funeral of Mr. George Goddard, the elderly patient who committed suicide earlier in the show. Half the town is there, including Julie and deputy police officer, Nikki Banks. In the eulogy, it's revealed that 29 years ago, a dam burst and killed many people in town, including George's wife Helen Goddard. As the camera pans out, we see Helen, who is one of the returned, looks on from behind the trees. She walks away when the priest reciting the eulogy says that George has reunited with his wife in heaven. As they're leaving the funeral, Julie's nosy neighbor, whom we saw earlier, tells her about the waitress who was stabbed in the tunnel. This revelation summons up some traumatic memories for Julie. Next, we are introduced to another of the returned, a handsome young man who walks through the forest to an old tin shack. He looks dazed and calls for his mother. To his surprise, when he breaks into his own home, everything is abandoned and desolate. On the other hand, Camille and her father Jack bond over some cigarettes. 
The two have a conversation where she asks if he's divorced from Claire. In response, her father says that Camille's death made it impossible for the two to be together. Their conversation is interrupted by Claire and Lena who arrive at the home together. After a few minutes, Camille goes to her sister's room where they exchange words of sympathy towards each other. Lena strips down in front of an envious, but benign Camille who assures Lena not to feel guilty about breaking their pact as they're free to do whatever they want now. Then, Camille notices a rather nasty scar on her sister's back. Before anything can be explored, Lena hits Camille's hand away asking her not to touch it. In the next scene, Peter finds Simon, who is now legally declared a transient, at the police station. The priest takes him to Caldwell Community Center for some clean clothes, food and counseling. But on the drive to the center, Peter reveals that he knows Simon came back from the dead. Surprisingly, he also says that he once knew someone who also came back after death. Although he doesn't pinpoint who, it is clearly implied that the priest isn't talking about Camille. Simon, who doesn't seem to know that he's returned from the dead, storms out of the car in denial. Meanwhile, Deputy Officer Nikki Banks comes knocking on Dr. Julie Han's door after she notices the former at George Goddard's funeral. She brings news of her attacker from seven years ago and tells Julie to be careful. It's revealed that Deputy Nikki Barnes was Julie's lover from seven years ago. However, the doctor refuses to talk as she is bitter that Nikki has not visited her once in all these years. She then slams the door before her ex-girlfriend can explain herself. Unbeknownst to both of them, Julie's nosy neighbor is spying on the duo. The scene then shifts to Tony Darrow, the owner of the Dog Star Bar, who comes snooping around to the same desolate shack where a young man had returned earlier. Inside, Tony finds an eviscerated carcass of a wolf hanging from the roof. Following this, he starts digging a grave to bury the wolf. The young man who had returned to the shack from the woods earlier approaches Tony asking him why he's burying his wolf. Shocked and disturbed, Tony knocks the young guy unconscious with his shovel. However, the mysterious man comes back to consciousness almost immediately and confronts Tony. After a brief confrontation which heats up to the point of brandishing shotguns, it is revealed that they are brothers and their mother died two years ago. Tony then reveals to his brother that he too had died two years ago. In the meantime, Lena shows up at Rowan's house and tells her that she met Simon. Furthermore, she also reveals that it was she who told him where to find Rowan. This revelation shocks the librarian who goes through a rush of emotions. She now knows that Simon is no longer just her figment of imagination, but actually real and alive. On the other hand, Simon returns to Peter and apologizes for his behavior earlier. Peter consoles the young man and the two have a heartwarming conversation. Later that night, Rowan puts her daughter to bed and goes downstairs. To her surprise, she finds Simon waiting outside the window behind the curtains. The two long-lost lovers physically reunite with a kiss and start getting intimate. Unbeknownst to them, Tommy is watching them through his security camera feed which leaves him livid and heartbroken. Elsewhere, Julie's nosy neighbor threatens to call the police on her for illegally adopting Victor. Enraged, Julie yells back at her and in a fit of rage, tells her to drop dead. The doctor then consoles Victor before leaving for her duty at the hospital. When Victor is alone in the apartment, he makes a crayon drawing of the neighbor getting stabbed to death. Soon afterwards, he goes to the neighbor's door, knocks, and welcomes himself into her apartment. In a flashback scene from 29 years ago, we see Victor as a little boy, reading bedtime stories with his mother. A little bit later, he wakes up to loud screams and gunshots. Scared and confused, the little boy hides in his closet. A masked invader enters the room and soon finds Victor hiding in the closet. However, he tries to calm the kid by telling him to sing a song inside his head to distract himself from what's going on. Just then, another invader comes in and sees that there's someone in the closet. Without hesitation, he shoots at the closet, killing Victor on the spot. In the present day though, Julie wakes up with Victor on her side. She hears someone scream outside her door. When she walks out of her apartment, the doctor is greeted by a horrific scene. Her neighbor is dead on the floor, her stomach is slashed, and her pet cats are eating her tongue. Meanwhile, Rowan's daughter, Chloe, informs that she has been hearing creaking noises from the attic. Afraid that her secret will be ousted, Rowan quickly tells her that houses sometimes make creaking noises while settling on the ground below. In reality, Simon has been living in the attic and Tommy is fully aware of this. After Tommy leaves for the station, Rowan brings food up to the attic where Simon has been hiding. He immediately starts kissing her, but she stops him before things escalate. Bummed by this, he mentions how she kept his guitar. In response, Rowan tells him that she has safely kept all of his belongings. In the next scene, Nikki comes over to Julie's apartment. The two ex-lovers have a conversation when suddenly, Victor runs out of the bathroom after being scared by the flickering lights. Before any question is raised about the child, Julie comes clean and reveals that she found the kid by the roadside 
and has been taking care of him ever since. However, Nikki gets mad at her for keeping Victor away from the police. At the police station, Jack is being questioned by Tommy about the dubious circumstances surrounding the attack on Lucy, the waitress. He tries to get the accused to admit he hurt Lucy, but vehemently denies the allegations. After the brief interrogation, Tommy goes back to his office to look at the surveillance videos of his home. Unfortunately for him, Rowan is having sex with Simon, leaving him enraged. The scene then shifts to Julie who finds crayon paintings, depicting the scene of her neighbor's death. She realizes that these were drawn by Victor. Worried, she searches for the little kid and finds him hiding in her closet. She then questions him about the drawings, but he simply stares at her quietly. After Chloe returns home from school, she once again hears creaking noises from the ceiling. When she looks up to examine, the kid notices a weird red light in the smoke alarm. Soon afterwards, Tommy watches the video footage as Chloe and Rowan discover hidden cameras. Following this, Rowan tells Simon about the cameras. He wants her and Chloe to leave with him. Chloe comes up to the attic. Rowan introduces him to Chloe and says her dad has come back as an angel. Rowan tells Simon she needs to hear Tommy's explanation before she decides anything. In the meantime, Lena has been hospitalized with a mysterious wound on her back. The doctor tells Claire that the wound is from being impaled on something. This comes as a surprise to her as Lena hasn't been in any accidents. Furthermore, the doctor adds that the wound is spreading and Lena's body is turning on itself. Outside, Peter tells Claire about Jack being questioned about Lucy's attack. Claire, however, gets defensive about her ex-husband and yells at Peter. Afterwards, Jack arrives at the hospital and sees that Lena is getting worse. On the other hand, he explains his relationship with Lucy to his ex-wife. Feeling betrayed, Claire tells him she's not moving anywhere with him. At the church, Peter is helping Helen get settled at the community center when Nikki walks in with Victor. It is revealed that Helen recognizes Victor, although she doesn't disclose this to anyone. That night, when Tommy gets home, Rowan confronts him about the hidden surveillance cameras. In his defense, the sheriff says he installed the cameras so that he could watch over her. Ever since Simon's death, she had spiraled into a destructive lifestyle, and oftentimes engaged in self-harm. Tommy argues that he didn't want her to hurt herself again. However, when Rowan threatens to leave him, he reveals that he had previously lied to her about the manner of Simon's death on Pastor Leon's orders. In a shocking twist, he reveals that Simon had actually committed suicide by stepping in front of an 18-wheeler truck. This new information leaves her devastated. Back at the hospital, Lena flashes back to four years ago when Camille died. She and her friends snuck into the funeral home where Camille was brought. There, Lena sees her twin sister's body and hugs her. When she lifts the body up, she sees a wound in Camille's back. A metal piece of the bus had gone through her back. In the ending scene, Peter asks Victor if he's okay. Sensing some nervous energy, Peter tells the kid to sing a song inside his head. In a shocking twist, Victor realizes Peter was the invader who had told him the exact words right before he died. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.